Um, hey, we'll dive straight into it. Isaiah 26 and verse 3 of Isaiah 26, 3, this is one of my favourite verses in... Oh, by the way, thank you, Luke. I just want to say that Luke is amazing up the back there. Stand up, Luke. Yeah. Stand up for me. Luke's amazing. I, I came up with, because I'm not the most tech-savvy person, I came up with a nice background and put the scriptures, everything on a PowerPoint presentation, sent it to Luke and said to Luke, if you think that people can't read it and doesn't look good, change it. And he's changed it and it looks way better what you've done, mate, than what I had. So maybe I should just stick to what I'm good at, which is not PowerPoint presentations that look fancy. Uh, Isaiah 26.3. This is one of my favourite uh, verses, in uh, not just uh, that came out of the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, but it's one of my favourite passages in the entire collection of ancient documents that we call a Bible, right? You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust you. It, it, you'll keep in perfect peace Peace, those whose minds are steadfast. That word steadfast means to, to lean upon or to rest against. So what he's saying is that, that, that God, you'll keep people in perfect peace, those whose minds. Now, what have we been talking about the last X amount of weeks? We're talking about the renewing of the mind. We're going to go back to Romans 12 in a second. We've been talking about the mind and renewing our mind and, and the importance of renewing our mind. Uh, some people would say, use the term thinking biblically. I don't like that term because that all then comes back to your definition of what's biblical and so on. And, uh, but but, but it's, it's trying to reorient our minds back to the way that God originally intended our minds to be and thinking the way that God originally wanted us to. And Isaiah is saying here that God, God is the one. God will keep you in perfect peace. God's the one. So, see, peace comes from God. Right? Peace is something that God wants to give to us, not something we, 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 we try to find. This is what gets a lot of people in trouble in life. Before I came to faith, I tried a lot of different things. Before the age of 19, when I, when I finally came, I, I tried to find peace in so many other things. Let's face it, at the end of the day, most of life is a search for peace, isn't it? Most of life is a search for this, 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 this place on the inside of us where turmoil dissipates, where, where heaviness goes, and we kind of feel that freedom and joy. We will call it all kinds of things, but at the end of the day, life is really a search for peace. People, people drink themselves stupid, not because they love pouring liquid down their throat. Usually there's something else going on in their life, and the excessive drinking or drug taking or whatever, these things are distractions from this, whatever this is. We want to distract ourselves from this, and so we do it by coming over here and all this stuff, because we want peace, because this thing doesn't give us peace. And so we want to distract ourselves from that, and we come over here, and we dive into all kinds of destructive behaviors, but at the very core of it, human beings, we want peace. We want peace, because we were created and designed to flourish in peace. But the world pulls us into pieces, right? Doesn't it? It, it tears us to pieces. God wants to put us back together and give us peace. And what Isaiah is saying is that God's the one, he will give you peace. And, and the way that he, he pours peace upon us, he says, your peace in this life is directly related to where your mind's leaning. Your ability to have peace in this life has a connection to the place that the mind is focused on. He says, if, you, if your mind is steadfast, in other words, if your mind is leaning upon God, and, and for the right reasons too, he says, he'll keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Right? Because we trust in God. Because we, 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 we can bring our lives under the goodness of God, the, the character and the nature of God. He was a good God, a loving God. A God that wants nothing but the best for us, the best from his heavenly wisdom and heavenly perspective. Sometimes that might not feel like it for us, you know. I was thinking this week about Joseph. Anyone remember the story of Joseph? Now, there's a guy that went through the ringer, right? Joseph went through it. He has this dream and all his older brother's beanstalks bow down to his beanstalk and he, he, he does what most young guys do. They blab it, blah. Tells his older brothers, you guys one day are going to be subject to me. And the older brothers go, well, really? 
And then this begins this series of events in Joseph's life, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, ends up in prison, accused of, of, of being inappropriate with another man's wife and all sorts of stuff. And then one day, here he is, the, 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 the second in charge of Egypt, looking after all the food while uh, the rest of the world is starving. And his own family, the ones that caused this chain of events to get him there, come one day and they walk up to him and they go, can we please have some food? We're all starving to death. We're from this other place. And he looks at them and he recognises them, but they don't recognise him. And he turns away and he has a little cry, as you would. But, but he makes this statement to them when they find out who he is. They're, they're probably thinking he might be a little put out. I mean, considering we've just altered the entire course of his life, He may be a little put out. He may have a little bit of anger. He may be a bit frustrated towards us. He may want a bit of revenge. He may want to taunt us a bit. He may want to stand over us. He may want to say, hey, well, see this now? Now you guys better bow to me because I'm that big in you. But he says this to them. He says, what man meant for evil, he said, God meant for good. That is a mind that's fixed on God. Amen? That is a mind that's leaning on God. That is a mind that's going, you know what, sometimes I get what I want, sometimes I don't, but I trust God. And when I trust God, it allows me to cultivate peace. It allows me to be in a place of peacefulness. And that's what Isaiah is saying. If we're trusting God, if if our minds are leaning on God because we trust him, he says, you are setting yourself up for peace. Jesus made this statement. He said, peace I leave you, peace I give you. He said, not like the peace of the world. He said, the peace of the world is stapled to you, right? It's like if Mick Carcass thinks that having a million dollars is going to give him peace. I want you to imagine if I walked up to him with a staple gun, put a million dollar check on his head and stapled it to his forehead. Now, as long as he's got that million bucks, he might have peace. But what happens when I rip that million dollar check away? Your peace goes with it. Why? Because your peace is stapled to the million dollars. People think if I just meet Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, I will have peace. That peace I'm searching for and longing for and Mr. or Mrs. Right come along and you go, oh, I don't feel good. Oh. Nothing wrong with a Mr. Right or a Mrs. Right. But then one day, Mrs. Right goes, you know what? Your armpits are really smelly. I'm not going to walk with you anymore. Off you go. <laughs> and what happens? As Mr. Right goes or Mrs. Right goes, your peace goes too and you're back where you started from. Because peace is not something that we externally try to find. It's something God internally gives to us when our minds are leaning in the right place, in the right way. You, God, will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast on you because they trust in you. There's a direct connection between what's happening in our minds and our capacity to experience peace. It's amazing. I, I, I think this is such an important thing for the church to get a hold of right now, Romans 12, renewing our mind. Because we live in an age where mental health is, is epidemic. It's epidemic. And I'm not, I'm not standing here, please don't let anyone think that I'm simplifying mental health. I'm not saying that, uh, that all, you know, all mental health is not real and all you've got to do is think about God and it'll solve all you. I'm not saying that. So just be very clear, I'm not saying that. I'm not a health professional. I'm not a mental health professional. What I am saying is this, there's something inside of us that craves for God. Eternity is in our hearts. Eternity is in our hearts. And I see so often in these collection of ancient documents and I've experienced in my own life that when I can turn my mind or my attention towards God, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm facing, I can find a place of peace in that. A place of peace that goes, not my will but yours be done, Lord. Not my will but yours be done. So many people, their their sense of peace is, my will be done, Lord, and if you give me my will, I'll have peace. And if it's not my will, I'm going to kick and fuss and scream and argue and fight back. I'm going to say, you abandon me. I'm going to be like the disciples on the boat when Jesus is asleep and they're in the middle of a storm. Everyone remember that story? And it says, Jesus is asleep on a pillow. Remember that? He's asleep on a pillow. And the disciples kick Jesus, wake him up, and they say to him, don't you care that we are perishing? Would you think that he didn't know there was going to be a storm when he put him on the boat? In other words, do we think that the storm was not something that God was aware of? God uses storms, doesn't he? And so what does Jesus do? Stands up and says, peace be still. And everybody goes, look at that. He commands the weather and so on. And yeah, that's a miracle. Let me tell you something. If you're the guy that said, let there be and there was, that's not a big deal. I mean, if you're the guy that said, let there be light, and all of a sudden light poofed in the sky, boof. 
Telling a storm to calm down, it's really not that big of a deal, is it? I mean, that's an easy one. If I, if I rank all the miracles of God and the, the building of creation on a scale, telling a storm to wind, stop puffing. That's just not a big one, right? But we carry on about the, But then Jesus turns to the disciples, and what does he do? Then he says to them, where's your faith? Where's your faith? See, the real miracle is you can go through a storm and still sleep on a pillow. That's the miracle. You don't have, we don't have to jump and kick and scream and accuse God of not caring. The real miracle is there's Jesus sleeping, going, you know what, God? I have peace because my mind is leaning upon you. I'm steadfast. I trust in you. And I've got peace, even though I'm going through this storm. So, so, so peace is not subject to what's going on out there. Peace is something that God offers us on the inside, no matter what's going on out there. But mental health is such a, a big thing at the moment. And I just wonder, I just wonder whether as a church, I wonder whether we don't have part of the answer for the world. Hey, stop focusing on all that stuff. Stop letting your mind lean on all of that garbage out there. And why don't you reorient your mind towards God? Why don't we reorient our mind towards the goodness of God, the grace of God, the ever-presence of God? If we would reorient our minds, maybe, just maybe, that would be a really, really big part for us to begin to come back to a place of peace, to begin to come back to a place where we're not uh, uh, thrown about by every wind of doctrine, we're not tossed about by the wind and the waves and so on. Because according to Isaiah, God will keep us in perfect peace. God will allow us to be in a place of peace. Jesus said, I want to give you peace. And we're trying to make peace happen through all this other stuff. I think we've got to reorient our minds. And that's what we're talking about, isn't it? At the end of the day, when we're talking about renewing our minds, that's what we're talking about. Well, we're talking about reorienting our minds to back towards God. Because when our minds are oriented away from God, that's when most of our turmoil takes place in our lives. That's when things seem bigger than they probably should be. Because we get distracted from what should be the central focus of our lives, and that is the reality and the presence of God. Amen? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Verse 6 to 8 says this. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, what's it say to do? Present your requests to God. Right? In other words, reorient your mind. Reorient your mind. You've got all this stuff going on over here. There's stuff that's making me anxious. There's, there's situations, there's things going on, and I'm looking at those things, and maybe I'm trying to work it all out myself. Maybe I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed. And, and what, the, what uh, Paul's writing to Philippians is going, when all that comes upon you in that, that's a sign, perhaps that's a sign of a disoriented mind. So let's reorient our mind and take that stuff and place it over here where God is and bring it to God. Bring it to God. Reorient your mind. Sometimes the situation doesn't change. That's not the point. That's not the point. Sometimes God answers the prayer and miracles happen and I love when that happens. Sometimes he doesn't change the situation. Sometimes he changes me because I'm looking at the right things. Sometimes my perspective changes because when I'm looking at something from this camera angle, I'm only seeing that. When I come over here, I'm looking at it from a different angle and maybe it looks different. Maybe it looks different. But we're reorienting our mind. He says, don't be anxious about anything. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In other words, reorient your mind towards God. And then what happens, he says, when you reorient your mind towards God? What's going to happen? He says, and the, what? The peace. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. It, it's, it's a peace that goes beyond my ability to, to create. It's beyond my understanding, which means that I, I can't create it. I can't, well, if I can just hang on, if I could just get $50,000 check this week, if Jackie would just do what I tell her to do, if the kids would just stop ringing me at the wrong time, and if the Tigers could get another win, I would have so much peace. Thank you, Jesus. So, you know, it's not that. I can't work it out. This is what he's saying. He's saying that what we can do is take those things and reorient our mind back towards God, present these things to God, and with a mind fixed on God, not just fixed on the problem, he says, you know what the result will be? The result is that the peace of God that passes all understanding will come in and guard your hearts and your minds. 
The peace of God will come and guard your hearts and your minds. And I love what he says in the next verse. So here's the thing. You're all discombobulated, right? You like that word? Discombobulated over here with all these things that are going on. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to all that stuff there that you're looking at and freaking out and it's causing turmoil and you're losing your peace, I want you to pick it up and put it over here and hand it to me. And when you do that, the peace of God that surpasses our sin is going to come into your world and it's going to come to, to, into your heart and into your mind. Now, how are you going to maintain that peace? Well, verse 8, he tells us what to do to, to maintain that peace. He says, finally, after you've done verse 6 and 7, he says, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what? Think about such things. Think about such things. You know what happens when you stop thinking about what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy. When we stop thinking about that, what happens? We go straight back over here where we're anxious for everything and troubled and so on, and we lose that peace, don't we? We lose that peace. Paul's trying to say there is a connection between where our mind is leaning and resting upon and the peace that we carry in our hearts. And so we've got to reorient our minds. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, uh, renewing our minds. We're talking about reorienting our mind. Reorient our mind. How many of us realize that over the last six, seven weeks, whatever we've been talking about this, there are areas of your world where you need a reorientation. Anyone, anyone discovered any areas where you go, I need to reorient my mind? I've got areas of my life that as, as I'm, I'm studying through this and preaching to myself every Sunday about this, I'm going away and looking at certain areas of my life and going, you know what, I, I've got no peace over here. I'm struggling with this. Maybe I've got to reorient my mind in that area. That lack of peace is an opportunity, an invitation to me to reorient my life back towards God in that space so that I can experience peace again. Because when I'm looking away from God and I'm not oriented towards Him, peace is a hard thing to get. And then I strive and work hard to try to create an environment for peace. Well, that doesn't really work either. Because I can't control everything going on around me. I just can't. I can try, but you can't do it. You can't do it. Billy Graham said this once. He said, most of all, let the Word of God fill you and renew your mind every day. When our minds are on Christ... Satan has little room to maneuver. I love that saying. I love that saying. I'm going to say it again. Billy Graham, here's what he said. Most of all, let the word of God fill you and renew your mind every day. When our minds are on Christ, Satan has little room to maneuver. Little room to maneuver. Why? Because our minds are fixed on God. So this is the battleground, isn't it? This, this is the battleground. Stuff going on up here. Lies that some of us have believed our whole lives about who we are, about what we're capable of, about, about, about who, who would like us and who wouldn't like us, who'd want to be a friend and who wouldn't want to be a friend, and, you know, what, what things I, I, what places I could go and places I should... The, the, the stuff up here that runs riot, that the devil jumps on and reinforces this, the, the, these limiting thoughts and thinking processes, these outright lies that he throws up there. This is where the battleground is. And that's why in Romans 12, he says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. To be conformed takes no effort. All you've got to do is turn up. To be conformed, all you've got to do is hang out in the world. Just hang out. And without even realizing, you'll start thinking certain ways and probably acting certain ways and so on because of cultural expectations and pressures and the desire in us to belong and fit in and so on. We'll just conform. But it says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. He says what? Be transformed. And how are you transformed? He says, by the renewing of our minds. Let's go there. Let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you. We should, be, we should, all, we should all have this as a memory verse. We should all know this one. We've been talking about it for about seven weeks, right? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to what? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. In other words, live a life fully committed to God. That's what he's getting at. That's what he means. When he says, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, he's saying, live a life fully committed to God. Amen? Live a life that's fully committed to God. 
Not kind of committed, not partially. He's saying, no, no, I want you to... to and, and think about this. Romans 1 to 11 is the greatest theological explanation of our faith. What, what God did, why Jesus came, what was the purpose of it, what's transpired because of that, who are we now because of that, and so on. Romans 1 to 11 is this great theological uh, uh, treatise about our faith. It's a great explanation. And then he says, therefore, in other words, in light of all this great knowledge that I've just given you, all these great facts about what has happened and what has taken place, in light of all that, therefore, he says, your only reasonable response to that is to give yourself fully to God. There's no other reasonable and sensible response. If you understand what Jesus has done, there's no other reasonable and logical response than to give him everything that you have. This is what Paul's saying. He says, give him everything. Live a life that's fully committed to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is what true and proper worship is. It's not singing a song. It's living a life. It's 24-7. It's waking up and committing to God. It's not about being perfect, but it's about being aware, having my mind resting upon, leaning upon, focused on God all day, every day, at work, at school, at sport, when I'm awake, when I'm asleep, when I'm watching TV, when I'm listening to music, when I'm on the internet surfing, having my life totally committed and fully maintained on God. That's what he says. This is the only reasonable response. Jesus died for you. The least you can do is live for him. Amen? He died for you. The least you can do is live for him. We got the easy part of the deal, really, you know? This is your true, proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the renovating of your mind, the, the refurnishing of your mind, taking out the old stuff and putting in the new stuff refurnish your mind and then watch this he says then you'll be able to test and approve what god's will is his good pleasing and perfect will think about that here's what he's saying he's saying that verse one is paul telling us what we need to do he says you need to live a life fully committed to god in every era and verse two is paul telling us how we do that he says well you've got to be transformed by renewing your mind until you're transformed by the renewal of your mind you'll never fully live committed to god you never will because you won't know what the will of God is. Here's what he says, then you will know the will of God. In other words, the transformation of the mind is the process by which you begin to understand the will of God for your life. If you don't renew your mind, you will never understand the will of God. That's what he's saying. If you really want to know the will of God, now when we th hear the word will of God, we think about vocation or location, you know? Should I be a pastor? Should I be a missionary? Should I be a banker? Should I, do, you know? We've got this over-consumed mentality when we hear the word will of God with what, what should I be doing and where should I be living. And it's got nothing to do with that. You know, the most powerful part, and that when we think of will of God, what we need to think about is what he's saying here. Live your life holy and acceptable to God. Live as a living sacrifice. That's what he's saying the will of God is. So what he's saying is this, that here's, here's what I want you to do. Live a life fully committed to God. The only way that's going to happen is step one, start renewing your mind. Start renewing, because as you renew your mind, you'll know what the will of God is, and then when you know what the will of God is and you start living it, that's what it means to be fully committed to me. You see the circle? You renew your mind, you understand the will of God, then you start living out the will of God. That's what he's getting at when he says, present your body as a living sacrifice. In other words, I want you to live out the will of God in your life. You're not going to do that until you start renewing your mind. Why? Because you're going to be half thinking this way, but you're going to be half thinking that way, the way you've been conformed to think like the rest of the world. Why is this really, really important? This is really, really important, especially for the church right now, because we are having so, 2,000 years of Orthodox Christian belief is being challenged. Who knows that? There are so many things out there now that, that, that for 2,000 years, the church, and all of a sudden in the year 2024, we have, a, we have more revelation than the Apostle Paul when he wrote his own letters. Isn't that amazing? We've got more revelation than Peter. We've got more revelation than Jesus about his own Father's will today. Somehow we've got more revelation. And so what we do is we're taking the Word of God and we twist and we bend and so on, and we're getting away from Orthodox Christian belief that's always been there. And if we as a church don't renew our mind, guess what? We get caught up in that because we don't know what the will of God is on this issue or that issue. We don't know. And so somebody comes along with two or three scriptures and they're very smart, and we go, oh, hang on, well, maybe that's the way it is. And before you know it, we've got these whole movements in Christianity Anyone ever heard of deconstruction? Christians are deconstructing their faith. They deconstruct. Now, I, I think deconstruction to a degree is a healthy thing because there are things that I preached 10 years ago that I wouldn't preach anymore because I've deconstructed some of that stuff, but that's only, it's been torn down by the word of God and built back up by the word of God, not by what feels good to me, 
not by what's comfortable, not by what feels safe, not by what I'm allowed to say or not allowed to say. It's being torn down and built back up by the Word of God so that we can stand on something that when the storms come, our buildings won't topple down because we built it on a rock, the solid Word of God. That very thing that we need to use to renew our mind because if we don't renew our mind with the Word of God, we actually won't know what the will of God is. Is. And this is what Paul is saying here. This is what you need to do. The, way that you, the only possible way to be a living sacrifice is to renew your mind, because as you renew your mind, then you understand the will of God. And when you understand the will of God and start living it, that's what a living sacrifice is right there. It's not just about your vocation. It's not just what you do for a job or where you live. It's your life every day, how you live it. When you're in the workplace, the conversations and the way that you go with those things, the things you engage in, the things you don't engage in. The perspectives that we hold, the stuff that we take. Life is holistic, and so is Christianity. It's holistic. It's not just about the holy parts of life, the spiritual parts of life, and the rest don't matter. It's holistic. Once we've renewed our minds, we will be able to know the will of God, and walking daily in the will of God is what it means to offer your body as a living sacrifice, which is your true and your proper worship. But here's the thing. Do we actually want to know the will of God? That's a really important question. It's a really important question, and on the surface, every single one of us would say, yes, I do. Every one of us on the surface would say, yes, I want to know the will of God. But what if the will of God goes against what you want? What if it goes against what you want? What if it challenges the things that you do? What if the will of God runs across your strongly held beliefs on a particular issue? What if it requires something of me that I'm not prepared to do, or to stand for, or to stand against, or to say, what if the will of God cuts across some of that stuff? Are we open? Do we really want to know the will of God? And we would all say yes on the surface. John chapter 8, we've got this little story. Uh, Earlier on, a few verses earlier, it says that now, now Jesus was speaking to the Jews who believed him. So he's speaking to a bunch of people that have heard him preach some stuff and gone, we believe this, we, we, we agree with this, right? And then fast forward along a little bit further, here's what happens. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I've come here from God, I've not come on my own, God sent me. Watch this, why is my language not clear to you? Why am I saying why is my language not clear to you? Because it's obvious you're unable to hear what I say. And then he says this, you belong to your father the devil, wouldn't that be a kick in the guts? Eh? Wouldn't that be a kick in the guts? So a bunch of people that seven verses earlier said, we believe you. He says, you belong to your father the devil, and watch this, you want to carry out your father's desires. In other words, you've already made your mind up about these things. You're not really that interested in whether, whether, whether it's my will. You're not really that interested in whether I agree with it. You've already made your mind up about these things. And because you've made your mind up about these things, guess what? You're not understanding what I'm saying. Because you've already made your mind up. You've already made your mind up. Do we want to know the will of God? Or have we already made our mind up on certain issues and certain things? Have we already decided? No, God's okay with this. I had, well, there was this girl, this, this girl that me and Jackie knew many, many years ago. Lovely Christian girl. And she started dating this guy, right? And it wasn't good. And everybody around her that had walked with her for years tried to speak to her. Lovingly as they could, this is not good. We just have a check. This is not right. And here's why. This guy came to her and said, look, I've... I've... <laughs> she got a word that there will be false prophets would come. and So this guy came and said, well, I can interpret that for you. All them are false prophets, and I'm the true prophet. And So many people trying to speak the will of God to her, the truth. <laughs> Couldn't even hear it. She went ahead and married this guy. Didn't last that long. They hadn't been married long before she realized he was an alcoholic. He started getting abusive with her. This is a guy that was at Bible college. Carrying on like a total pork chop, the marriage fell apart. She was hurt and damaged and so on from this relationship. Yet here's God very clearly trying to speak to her his will. This is not right. But she'd already made her mind up. And when you've made your mind up, it doesn't matter what else you hear. You, you, we, we, we don't, we, we don't, they're not, you're not coming to God like this going, Lord, speak. Your will be done. What do you say about this? We don't come with an open heart, an open posture before the Lord. We've already determined that we know what the will of God is. Right? So ask that question again. Do we really want to know the will of God? Because Jesus says, if you really don't want to know the will of God in the area, he says, you're probably not going to know it because you're not going to hear it. It doesn't matter who says it to you. It doesn't matter how clearly it's outlined before you. So these guys wanted to walk with God, but they didn't want the change that comes with believing and obeying God's word. They didn't want the change. 
You want to carry out your father's desires. These people claimed to follow God but hadn't renewed their minds with the teachings of Jesus. Therefore, they didn't understand God's will. They couldn't understand it because they'd already made their mind up. Let me ask some questions. Here's the thing. If you don't want to understand the truth as God sees it, if you don't want to change in the areas that he wants us to change in, if we don't want to see things any different than the way we've been conformed to seeing them, if we don't want to understand God's perspective on our hurts or our disappointments like Joseph, if we're happy as we are and no longer believe that we're still on a journey of being molded into the image of Jesus, then we'll probably not experience the power and the benefits of a, re of a renewed mind because we'll probably never have one. Because we've already made our mind up. You know? The world tells me this. Society says that, so it must be right. Even if it doesn't, line up with the world of God. Are you open to having your life transformed by the word of God or are you trying to transform the word of God to fit into your life? It's a tough question. It's a tough question. I've got to ask myself that question all the time. I can stand up here and preach to everybody about being open to God, but I've got to daily submit my life as a living sacrifice to the Lord too. And so, well, God, that's got to be real for me too. I've got to walk in this every day. I've got to make this decision each day. How many of you know we're living in strange times, especially in the church space? Things, have been orthodox, things that have been orthodox belief for centuries are now being challenged, and there are some strange conclusions being drawn. I watched a message this week, right? Because I like to every now and then jump online and, and do a bit of research and, you know, look at stuff. I heard a preacher stand up in front of a church, and he said, you know what? It's great when we come here and we worship God, but the revelation I'm getting at the moment is, what if... When we come to worship and we're all focused on God, what if that's wrong? What if God wants to worship you? And he went on 40 minutes and preached to the congregation about how God wants to worship you. And you know what was more disturbing than the fact that he was preaching this stuff? All I could hear from behind the camera was people amening and cheering. Let's face it, who wouldn't want to think that God worshipped them? Who wouldn't want to think they're the center of the universe? Who wouldn't want to think that God sits around doting over them all day and whatever they do is fine and doesn't matter and it's all about you, you know, for the most important person in the world? You. Remember that ad a few years ago? Who wouldn't want that? Here's the thing. We, when we really want stuff, we start finding things in the Word of God and we start to draw to conclusions and there's some weird stuff and spaces that the church is falling into right now. I cannot believe, I, I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I cannot believe that people think there's more than a male and a female on planet Earth. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I, I'm open to be challenged on that, but I just want to put it out there and say to everybody, I believe male and female, he created them. For this reason, a man should leave his, his mother and father and, be, and cleave to his wife. That's what the Word of God says. That's the way that creation is. And, I, and here's the thing. I've actually got science backing me up. This is the crazy thing in the world we live 15 years ago, science was king, wasn't it? Whatever science said, oh, that Bible, ah, science, science, science. We love science. We live by science. We worship science. Now the science is saying there is really only male and female, but we are, ah, oh, forget that. We hate science. You know why? Because the heart wants what the heart wants, doesn't it? And if the heart doesn't want the will of God, the heart's not going to know the will of God. It, we, 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 we're moving away from it because we're not wanting the will of God. We, we, we might be saying we want the will of God, but we've got to keep challenging and asking ourselves the question, do we really want the will of God? Because the, the, the thing is, what I'm seeing here, is if you don't want the will of God, then you don't know the will of God. You don't renew, you, you, and before you know it, the church is way over here, and you're looking at this Christian space going, what is that? What is that? What's another pastor get up and praying to, to, to um, we thank you, Mother God? No, I'm not sexist. I'm, I'm not. But, but I'm sorry, but the, 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 the word he in the Bible when it speaks of the father has a masculine genitive to it. it, it it's not my fault. Don't get mad at me. It just is. Do, do I approve of the same sex marriage? Sorry, I don't want to be offensive, but I don't. Because I'm, I'm looking at the will of God going, I just don't think it's right. And I know it's way easier not to say that stuff anymore, but we're getting to a point where we need to start to get back to the word of God and the will of God. And if we don't renew our minds with the word of God, the world will conform our minds the way it wants it to go. That's just the reality, and it's happening. It's happening right in front of us, and it's chipping away daily at us. It's chipping away daily. And we need to get into the word of God. 
Remember 20 years ago, remember if you come to faith in Jesus, you'll have a million dollars and 15 cars and a jet. And Remember all that extreme prosperity teaching? What, 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 why, was it, why is all this stuff, why, are we so, why do we so easily fall for this stuff? Because deep down inside, it's, it's the world we want. We would love a world where we can do whatever we want and God would just love us and pour upon us and not care. And Basically, we want a world where we are gods of our own universe and we can dictate and control. I want a God that if I say I want something, he'll just give it to me. That, that, that's what we want. That's my will. That's, that's my flesh's will. But there's a will of God. And that will of God is the will of God. Not always my will, it's his will. But if I'm offering myself fully to him, renewing my mind, understanding his will and walking daily in that, guess what? There's no safer place to be than in the will of God. I had a friend of mine and his father, um, he was going over to India. This is back when, do you remember, um, uh, what was his name? Graham Staines. Do you remember, remember missionary Graham Staines? Yeah. So we were living over there in India at the time. And, and there was a, a friend of mine and his brother was, was uh, in America and, and he felt the Lord call him to come to India while we were there that same time. And his father said, no, you're not going over there. It's just too dangerous right now with what's going on in that country. And he turned and he said to his father, and he told me later, this is what was said. It was the most profound statement. He said, Dad, the safest place in the world is in the will of God. If God wants me over there, I don't care if they've got guns and knives, the safest place to be is in the will of God. And, I, and, and you know what? I believe that to be true. And it doesn't have to be in a third world country, in a place where there's persecution. The safest place for you to live your life every day on planet Earth right now is in the will of God. The safest place to go to school at is in the will of God. Safest place to go to work at is in the will of God. What do I mean by that? I'm not talking vocation or location. I'm talking the way you live your life. I'm talking what you allow your mind to be transformed to and what you no longer allow your mind to be conformed to. The safest place to be is in the will of God and the place where you'll have the most peace. He's in the will of God. John Piper, he's an author and Bible teacher, said this once. He said, without the renewed mind, we will distort the scriptures and avoid their radical commands for self-denial and love and purity and supreme satisfaction in Christ alone. Without the renewed mind, we'll distort the scriptures to avoid the radical commands of self-denial, love, purity and supreme satisfaction in Christ. In other words, an unrenewed mind looks for loopholes around the will of God. That's what an unrenewed mind does. It looks for loopholes. Oh, that scripture lets me off the hook. Don't have to be really, really don't have to focus on holiness. Oh, that scripture means I don't really have to pray. It's old anyway. It's 2,000 year old tradition. Oh, I don't need to gather with other believers. That one lets me off the hook. An unrenewed mind looks for loopholes and ways around obedience. See, without a desire to have our minds renewed by the word of God, we'll never begin to understand the will of God. If we don't understand what God says, here's what we will do. We'll fall back onto how we feel. And that's the world we're in at the moment. If we don't understand the will of God, then we'll fall back on what we feel. I feel like that's cruel to not allow those people to marry. It doesn't matter about how you feel. What's the will of God in that space? Oh, I feel like it's, it's cruel to, you know, look... Again, I, I, I have no intention. I didn't want to be controversial this morning, but I just think some of these spaces, here's the bottom line. This is what renewing our mind is all about. It's about discovering the will of God and walking in the will of God. And walking in the will of God is the safest place for a human being to walk. And there's also no more peaceful place than in the will of God. Can I get the news? Out? You guys want to come back? You guys come back. We're going we're gonna to finish with a song. Um, um, that that, that um, praise, you know that song, praise, praise, let everything that has breath? I want to sing that. Is that okay? We're going we're gonna to sing that. Um, Mary and Martha, who loves that story? Mary and Martha. You have your moments? Yeah. Sometimes you're Mary, sometimes you're Martha. <laughs> it's okay. Nothing wrong. Sometimes I'm Mary, sometimes I'm Martha. Which actually sounds really wrong, considering what I've just talked about. But you know what I mean. Let me just go there real quick, just while, while we sing this. Luke, where are we? Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I just want you to see a very simple little thing. Luke chapter 10. 
Verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples, they, they won't have this, I didn't give it to them. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Let me just tell you something about that. That is really, really wrong. Jesus is a rabbi, a teacher. And in that culture, the only people that are allowed to sit at the feet of a rabbi and listen are men. Women aren't allowed to do it. Culturally, we read this story. Culturally, Martha's the hero. because She's doing everything culturally right. Preparing food, letting the men do the men's stuff. Running around busily. She's the hero, culturally. Mary, she's breaking cultural rules here. She's not the hero. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. She's renewing her mind. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work? Tell her to help me. I'm doing everything culturally right here. I wonder how Mary felt sitting there. Oh, here's the thing. I reckon Mary probably felt the gaze of the other man in the room. She probably felt the frustration of her sister. So she's sitting in this place doing the right thing, but I'll bet you her feelings weren't high-fiving. Yes, this is right. This is... She would have felt all the stuff that went with standing outside of culture. She would have felt it. Now, if you're going to live by feelings, guess what Mary does? She gets up and goes and starts preparing food. That's what she does. But she's not living by feelings. She's not living by feelings. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. Always, if God ever calls your name twice, you know something's going to happen. <laughs> You're worried and upset about many things. A few things are needed. Watch this, or indeed only one. Mary's chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Listen to what he's saying. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. Many things. What's your mind leaning on? You're worried and upset. Many things, many things will cause you to be discombobulated. Worry is found in the many things. But few things are needed, Jesus says. Only few things are really needed. Only few things are really needed. And when you're the kind of person that offers their bodies a living sacrifice, there's only few things needed. There's only few things really in life that matter. Number one is the word and will of God. My life is a drop in a bucket. I'm here today, gone tomorrow. It's going to be over that quick. I cannot believe I'm about to turn 52. It's amazing. I remember 19 years of age, standing on a roundabout, giving my life to Jesus. Where has the last 30 odd years gone? <laughs> serious, I'm serious. Where has it gone? The next 30, if they go that quick, I'll be gone by lunchtime tomorrow. <laughs> That's what it feels like. What am I going to do? I don't want to spend my life chasing the many things and constantly being worried, fearful. I want to narrow it in. Only a few things matter, people. Only a few things matter. Now, what are we going to do? Are we going to commit to renewing our mind with the Word of God? Are we going to make that personal commitment to do that? Or are we going to continue to be conformed to the pattern of this world? One way leads to life. One way leads to death. One way leads to peace. One way leads to turmoil. But the choice is ours. Amen? choice is ours. Let's all stand. We're going we're gonna to finish with, with, with this worship song together. I love this song. Let everything that has breath praise, praise let everything that has breath That means if you're a chair, you don't have to do it. You, you, you can just sit there and just look pretty. Carpet, you don't have to do a thing. Plant, you can just, well unless you think plants live. These ones don't, they're plastic. But if you've got breath in your lungs, then I'm telling you right now, part of the will of God is that we would...
praise. We would praise. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for your word, Lord. I know, God, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm very convinced everybody in this room, we all want to live committed fully, wholeheartedly. We want to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you, God. I know that we do. I believe with my heart, God, we, we are a, we're a community of people that love you, Jesus. But God, I do pray, would you challenge us with that question? Do we really want to know the will of God or not? The decisions, the choices, the way we live, do we really want to know the will of God? Holy Spirit, would you challenge us with that? And as we get into your word, I pray, would you renew our minds? Would you help us to see those areas where we have been conformed to a pattern that you want us to now be transformed into what you want us to be, Father? Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord.